This is Chapter 11 of Wilkins. We're going to discuss vital signs. We discussed this just a little bit in class. Um, the chapter outline is in your textbook, so we're going to talk about temperature, pulse, respiration, blood pressure, documentation, always documentation. So um, the determination of four vital signs, body temperature, pulse, respiration rates, and blood pressure is considered standard procedure in patient care. There used to be a fifth vital sign, and that was smoking. And uh, smoking was taken out as the fifth vital sign in this 12th edition of Wilkins. In the previous hundreds of editions, uh, actually many other editions, uh, they always included smoking. Uh, so for some reason, it was taken out. So we've got body temperature, pulse, Respiration and blood pressure are the uh, standard pr uh, procedures in patient care for vital signs. So patient preparation, you're going to uh, have the patient uh, seated upright at eye level for instruction. You explain the vital signs to and obtain their consent, otherwise it is co considered battery. You explain how vital signs can affect dental hygiene and dental treatments. A lot of times they're kind of shocked. Oh, I, I'm just getting my teeth cleaned. Why are you taking my blood pressure? Um, and so you explain why that you're using it as a screening device. You do it for all patients. They're not being singled out for any reason. And, um, and that you use it as a way to educate the patient. And during the process, you explain each step as needed. Most patients, aside from little uh, children, have had their blood pressure taken before, so the explanation can be very simple. But for your dental hygiene care planning, uh, reporting vital signs contributes to the proper sy uh, systemic evaluation of a patient in conjunction with the complete medical history. So dental hygiene care planning and appointment sequencing are directly influenced by your findings. Can the patient tolerate a morning appointment, an afternoon appointment, an all-day appointment? Do they need shorter appointments? When vital signs are not within normal limits, uh, you need to advise the patient to check with their physician. Sometimes you don't even get to treat the patient. They are dismissed if things are that out of the norm. And referral for medical evaluation and treatment is oftentimes indicated. So look on... Um, the box 11.1 for your keywords that are related to vital signs. You might be seeing them again. All right, body temperature. Temperature isn't one of those things that we routinely take in the dental office, but while preparing the patient history and making the extraoral and intraoral examinations, the need for taking the temperature may become apparent. If you're feeling around the head and neck area, and you might find that they feel very warm. Or the dentist may have requested that the procedure of a temperature be taken in conjunction with their current oral disease. If they come in with something called um, necrotizing ulcerative gingivitis, the doctor will want to know, do they have a fever? Because that might be the determining factor, whether that particular patient requires an antibiotic to reduce infection or not. So the indications for taking temperature include um, new patients just as a, um, a baseline for a complete examination during the maintenance appointment. When oral infection is known to be present, for example, that no necrotizing ulcerative gingivitis or periodontitis, sometimes fever is associated with that. Apical or periodontal abscesses, acute pericoronitis, if they have an infection around a partially erupted lower mandibular wisdom tooth, and along with other vital signs prior to the administration of local anesthesia. Um, and at any appointment when the patient reports illness or if they are suspected of infection. Uh, it's the protection of the health of the healthcare personnel, you and the patient or the families also who may be exposed secondarily to having somebody that is actively sick in the office. So special significance during epidemics when uh, community exposure at risk is really important. We don't want sick patients coming into our offices and spreading aerosols. Now what we 
prefer and what the dentist prefers because it's their schedule and their income is are sometimes two different things. But um, you might need to take a temperature also for a patient's referral for medical care when it's indicated. Uh, but the maintenance of body temperature for adults, you need to know these ranges. The normal average temperature is 37 degrees Celsius. That's your 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit. And the normal range is from 35.5 to 37.5 Celsius. And that translates to 96 degrees to 99.5. That's the normal range. So if somebody's normally running hot at 99, it doesn't mean that they have a temperature. So you want to ask the patient, do you know what your normal is? For older adults over 70 years of age, the average temperature is slightly lower. For children, there's no appreciable difference between boys and girls. The average temperatures are for a first year of life, 37.3 degrees Celsius, and this is all in your book, or 99.1 degrees Fahrenheit. Fourth year, 37.5, about the same, 99.4 degrees Fahrenheit. Fifth year, 37 or 98.6, 12th year, 98, okay, and temperature variations. Now, you need to know some uh, terms, pyrexia, okay, that's fever, and a fever is, or pyrexia is a value over 37.5 or 99.5 and above, over that. Hyperthermia values over 41 degrees. Celsius, that's 105.8 degrees Fahrenheit. That is a high, high temperature. And hypothermia values below 35.5, and that's 96 degrees Fahrenheit. Factors that alter the body temperature could be the time of day. It's highest in late afternoon and early evening and lowest during sleep and early morning. Temporary increases of temperature can be during exercise, drinking hot fluids, smoking, or the application of external heat. Um, pathological states, infection, dehydration, hyperthyroidism, myocardial, myocardial infarctions, that's a heart attack, or tissue injury from trauma can increase blood pressure. I'm sorry, temperature. I'm talking temperature. Woo. Uh, decreasing temperature can be starvation, hemorrhaging, you're losing um, blood, as well as physiological shock. Methods for determining temperature, the location of the measurement. You can have oral. It's the most common site due to the ease of access. But drinking hot or cold liquids just prior to taking the temperature is going to affect what the thermometer says, so it's advised that you wait at least 15 minutes before you take an oral measurement. It's not recommended for infants, young children, the unconscious, and patients that have uh, behavioral issues. You don't want them biting and breaking the, um, the thermometer. Temporal artery, which is your forehead, those measurements are taken with an electronic device. I think they are way cool. Uh, they're easily tolerated, and the results are comparable to the oral thermometers. They have ear devices with a tympanic device. Uh, medical or hospital applications use, uh, can use the axilla or rectum for assessment. And there are different types of thermometers. Uh, there are electronic thermometers, and they are covered with disposable protective sheets. They go under the tongue. Let me see if I got a picture. Yeah, they go under the tongue. Um, they uh, give a digital readout. There are tympanic thermometers, and they are, again, covered with a protective sheath, and they're inserted gently into the ear canal. After short exposure, two to five seconds, uh, you'll hear a beep, and that will uh, record on the device what the temperature is. And there are disposable paper or chemical thermometers. And those are chemically treated uh, for oral or axillary use. Uh, they've got raised dots that change color to reflect the temperature. And they are single use and ideal uh, when infection control is a concern. Uh, there are temporal artery thermometers. 
and those uh, measure the temperature of the skin over the temporal artery of the head. He uh, placed the scanner on the center of the forehead, midway between the eyebrow and the hairline, and then you slide the thermometer across the forehead until the hairline is reached. And that's what the picture of that little boy is. Um, you replace the protective cap after the temperature is taken. Uh, the old thermometers had mercury in glass. The blue tip was the oral, and the red tip was the rectal. And they're no longer used because of the risk of uh, mercury exposure. My mother was a nurse for almost 50 years, and those old mercury thermometers um, are still around in linen closets throughout the country. Uh, one mercury thermometer broke in Maryland, and it closed down the entire middle school with the amount of mercury that was spilled. And we're talking a minuscule amount of mercury in these thermometers. But it's taken seriously these days. So patients that come in with a high uh, temperature of fever, pyrexia, of uh, 41 degrees Celsius or 105.8, you treat them as a medical emergency. They are not there for elective services, and I can tell you they're not feeling so good. Uh, they need to be transported to a hospital. 105 is an extremely dangerously high temperature, and seizures could result as well as brain damage. You want to check for temporary or factitious causes. Make sure a factitious, did they do something to themselves? Did you just drink a pot of coffee? Did you just smoke? Okay, sometimes you have to wait that 15 minutes and repeat it. Review the medical dental history and postpone elective oral care. Okay. Let's go on to pulse. And the pulse is the intermittent throbbing sensation felt when the fingers are pressed against an artery. It's the result of the alternate expansion and contraction of the artery as a wave of blood is forced out of the heart. The pulse or heart rate is the count of the heartbeat. And irregular, uh, irregularities of strength, rhythm, and quality of the pulse are noted while counting the pulse rate. And we have a template for you to fill out when you're taking your vital signs in both of our, um, at GCC as well as MEC, that not only are you going to write the pulse down, but you are going to write your qualifiers. It's going to have um, word prompts for you, and you're not just giving a number. You are qualifying. Is it shallow? Is it strong? Is it irregular? Is it steady? And the book, uh, your Wilkins, has a lot of good um, terms for you to be able to use as well as in the clinic help portion of Blackboard. Uh, what are the normal pulse rates for adults? There's no absolute normal. The range can be anywhere from 60 to 100 BPM beats per minute. Slightly higher for women than men. The more aerobic the person is, the lower the pulse rate. So a runner might have a pulse rate of 60 versus a non-runner might have a pulse rate of 88. They're both considered normal. But a runner is more cardiac, has a better cardiac fit, fitness level. Children, the pulse rate um, or heart rate falls steadily during childhood. So it starts out a little bit high and then decreases. Factors that influence pulse rate and then usually fast pulse rate. Then that's over 100 beats per minute in an adult is called tachycardia, T-A-C-H-Y, tachycardia. An unusually slow heartbeat below 50 beats per minute is called bradycardia. And you need to know those terms. Increased pulse can be caused by exercise, stimulants, eating strong, eating strong emotions, extremes of heat as well as cold, and some forms of heart disease. Things that can decrease your pulse. Think about when you're sleeping, okay? It's caused by sleep, depressants, fasting will slow your pulse rate, quiet emotions, as well as low vitality from prolonged illness. There are emergency situations, so take a look at um, 
your textbook for those. The procedure for determining the pulse rate, all right, for the sites, the pulse can be felt in several um, points over the body. We typically will feel for the radial pulse, which is at the wrist. Other sites convenient for the use in a dental office or clinic could be the temporal artery on the side of the head in front of the ear, or the facial artery at the border of the mandible, the carotid artery, which you know is used during CPR, the brachial pulse, and we use that as uh, used for the infant. So, we're going to tell the patient what's going to be done. We're going to be taking your vital signs, and you have the patient in a comfortable position with the arm and hand supported, palm down. You locate the radial pulse on the thumb side of the wrist with the tips of your first three fingers. Okay, you don't want to use your thumb again because that has a pulse, and you can confuse your pulse with the patient's pulse. So you're going to uh, feel the pulse. When the pulse is felt, you exert light pressure and count for one clock minute. Right? You're not doing it for a half a minute and timesing it by two. You're not doing it for 15 seconds and timesing it by four. You're doing it for a full minute because you want to feel for the, any irregularities as well. You want regular rhythm, all right? And sometimes it's regular, regularly irregular, and irregularly irregular. And you need that minute to really feel that. Uh, you're going to talk about rhythm, volume, and strength. Is it full, strong, poor, weak, thready? You record the date and pulse rate as BPM with other uh, characteristics on the patient's record. So a pulse rate over 100 is considered abnormal for adults and require further investigation. Uh, sometimes they're just nervous as well. So this picture shows you the arteries of the arm and you want to note where the radial pulse is as well as the brachial pulse because you're going to be feeling both of those. Determination of the pulse rate, A is the correct position and for the hand, B, the tips of the clinician's first three fingers are placed over the radial pulse, and you're not using your thumb. So respiration is always taken along with the pulse, and you're not telling the patient you're taking the pulse, now I'm going to be count looking at your respirations. You just keep your hand on the pulse, on their radial pulse, and you, you just continue to count. Oftentimes I'll tell my patients if they're staring at me, just close your eyes and relax. I'm going to be, uh, you know, feeling this for, I'll be having my hand on you for two full minutes to make sure I have an accurate pulse rate, and that's, that's all they need. But the uh, function of respiration is to supply oxygen to the tissues and to eliminate the carbon dioxide. There are variations in normal respiration, uh, such as rate, rhythm, depth, quality, and may be symptomatic of disease as well as emergency states. So for normal respiration, for uh, adults, the adult range is anywhere from 12 to 20 per minute, slightly higher in women. For children, the res uh, respiration rate decreases slightly during childhood. Some of the factors that can influence respiration rate are the same factors that can influence pulse rate. So a rate below 12 per minute, bradypenia, B-R-A-D-Y-P-N-E-A, just like bradycardia, slow heart rate, bradypenia, slow breathing, slow respiration, is considered subnormal for an adult. Over 28, tachypenia, and rates over 60 are extremely rapid and dangerous. To, uh, for increased respiration, that is often caused by work or exercise, excitement, nervousness, strong emotions, pain, hemorrhage, as well as shock. Decreased respiration can be caused by sleep, certain drugs and medications, as well as pulmonary insufficiency. 
So procedures for observing respirations, you want to make the count of respirations immediately after counting the pulse. Maintain your fingers over the radial pulse, and the respirations must be counted so the patient really isn't aware, because if they know you're counting their breaths, they're going to start changing how they breathe. So you count the number of times the chest rises in one clock minute. Again, you're not making shortcuts for this. You are going to observe the depth, the rhythm, the quality, the sound, and record that. The depth, you describe as shallow, normal, or deep. Rhythm, you describe as regularly, regular, excuse me, are they evenly spaced or irregular with pauses of irregular length between. The quality, you describe as strong, easy, weak, labored, or noisy. The sound, describe deviant sounds made during inspiration when they're breathing in as well as expiration or both. Normally we don't hear anything. Sometimes you'll hear some wheezing. In the position of the patient, when the patient assumes an unusual position to secure comfort during breathing or prefers to remain seated upright, you need to make sure that you mark the record accordingly because they might have breathing issues if they don't want to lie down all the way. So one of the things that you would ask is, do you have to sleep propped with pillows? So blood pressure. The components of blood pressure. Blood pressure is the force exerted by the blood on the blood vessel walls. When the left ventricle of the heart contracts, blood is forced out of the aorta and travels through the large arteries to the smaller arteries, arterioles, and capillaries. The vessels of the heart okay, are shown um, in chapter 67 if you need to review that. Pulsations extend from the heart through the arteries and disappear in the arterioles. During the course of a cardiac cycle, the blood pressure is changing constantly. So we have a systolic pressure as well as a diastolic pressure. The systolic pressure is the peak or the highest pressure. It's caused by ventricular contraction, and the normal systolic pressure for an adult is less than 120 millimeters of mercury, less than 120. Diastolic pressure is the lowest pressure. It is the effect of ventricular relaxation. The normal diastolic pressure for adults is less than 80 millimeters of mercury. So 120 over 80 used to be what we considered a normal range. Notice how I'm saying it's less than that now. Now at 120 over 80, it is considered to be pre-hypertensive. There's pulse pressure, and that's the uh, pulse pressure is the difference between the systolic and diastolic pressure. Factors that influence blood pressure, you've got the um, blood pressure depends on the force of the heartbeat, peripheral resistance, the condition of the arteries, the changes in elasticity of the vessels that uh, can occur with age and disease, also depends on the volume of blood in the circulatory system. Factors that increase blood pressure can uh, be exercise, eating, stimulants, emotional disturbance. The use of oral contraceptives can increase blood pressure. Also, blood pressure tends to increase with age, as well as the length of use of oral contraceptives. So when we have a patient taking oral contraceptives, um, we do put them as an ASA2 because there could be blood pressure related issues. Factors that decrease blood pressure, fasting, rest, depressants, quiet emotions. Similar to heart rate. The equipment for blood pressure, you need a manometer, and that's made up of a pressure me measuring device, which is the manometer, and an inflatable cuff to wrap around the arm and under certain circumstances the leg. <coughs> you have a mercury 
sphygmomanometer, which is an analog, and that's the traditional system, but mercury with its potential health hazard um, and mercury spillage is less commonly used today, and it's shown to be more accurate, though, and consistent than other types. So that's the mercury analog. Then you have your aneroid sphygmomanometer, which is an analog, and that's compact portable glass enclosed gauge with a needle for registration of the blood pressure, and it requires regular calibration to keep accurate. There are electronic or digital sphygmomanometers, and those are automatic uh, determination of blood pressure without the use of a stethoscope. And also, you need to choose the right size cup, and that's critical for taking blood pressure. So the cup should be long enough to encircle 80% of the arm and wide enough to encircle 40% of the arm at its midpoint. A longer, wider cup is required for larger arms. Now, the risk for finger devices uh, in the automatic cuffs are considered to be less accurate and are not considered for professional use. So we don't allow wrist cuffs in the clinic. We need a stethoscope with the type of blood pressures that we're taking, and that consists of a diaphragm or cuff end piece that transmits and sends sound through the tubes to the earpieces. It's used with mercury or aneroid type analog sphygmomanometers. So what's the procedure? You're going to repair the patient. All right, this is telling you the sizes of the cuff. And the nice thing with the cuff that we have at the neck, we have a standard adult. It tells you where to put um, things. So it tells you where to put these hoses, okay? As well as it tells you when you're wrapping the cuff around the patient, it tells you when you need a larger cuff. So it's got those markings on it, just as a guide. You're going to tell the patient briefly what you're going to be doing. We're taking a blood pressure. We do this on every patient. We'll be doing this each and every appointment. We are doing it as a screening service for you. Uh, detailed explanations it can be avoided. You seat the patient comfortably with their arms slightly fat flexed and their palm up with their whole forearm supported on a level surface at the level of the heart. So for our units, what we oftentimes we'll do is have the patient just uh, bring up their knee a little bit and they can prop their own elbow on their knee. The thing is also we want to have minimal patient contact. The arm above the heart will result in a low false reading. The arm below the heart level re will result in a false high reading. So you want to be heart level. Improper cuff selection can result in a false high or a false low as well. The use of either arm unless otherwise indicated, for example, handicapped, uh, history of vascular surgery, mastectomy with lymph nodes would uh, indicate an arm on the opposite side of use. So we usually do RAS, right arm sitting, because that's where our operator stool is on the right, so that's where we're taking our blood pressure, right arm sitting. Take the blood pressure on a bare arm, not over clothing, and you want to loosen any tight sleeves. You select the cuff size, you apply the cuff, you apply the completely deflated cuff on the patient's arm, support it at the level of the heart, and if the arm rests on the arm of the dental chair higher than the heart, again, it's going to um, be different than if it's directly at heart level. You place a portion of the cuff that contains the inflatable bladder directly over the brachial artery. And um, the cuff that we have has an arrow that lets you know where that brachial um, artery is as far as this is where you place the cuff. The lower edge of the cuff should be placed one inch above the antecubical fossa. Fasten the cuff evenly and snugly. You adjust the position of the gauge or dial so that you can see it. It's facing you. Then you want to locate the radial pulse. And you palpate about one inch below the antecubical space uh, to get the 
brachial artery pulse first. You hold your fingers on the pulse, okay? You want to mark that landmark so either the patient can be holding the end of the stethoscope or you just know where you're going to be placing the end of the stethoscope. But you're going to then find the radial pulse and you're going to inflate the blood pressure cuff until you no longer feel the radial pulse. Then you can close the valve and pump it to 10 to 20 millimeters of mercury higher than that. Now, what we tell our uh, students at school is you find your radial pulse, you find your brachial pulse. I know where the end of the stethoscope is going to be. I place the end of the stethoscope there. I have the patient hold it for me. Then I've got my fingers on the radial pulse. I pump, 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 pump. I no longer feel the radial pulse. I then take my fingers, I say thank you, and I take my fingers and I now hold the end of the stethoscope and I continue to pump 10 to 20 millimeters of mercury higher than that and then I can start deflating the cuff. So we want you to be practicing this blood pressure on everybody you can practice with because the more times you do it, the more familiar you will be with the sound of the blood pressure cuff as well as the routine of feeling for the brachial pulse and feeling for the radial pulse. So you want to, after you no longer feel the radial pulse, you want to continue to pump um, 10, 20, sometimes 30 points beyond when you no longer feel that radial pulse. Again, you've cut off all the circulation of the patient and that is the maximum inflation level. So we don't want to just really nilly pump everybody up to 180 degree, uh, millimeters. It's uncomfortable and if my blood pressure was 110 for my systolic, that's way higher. You shouldn't be pumping me over 140. And if my blood pressure is 190 and you only pump me up to 180, you still haven't gotten it. So you're going to position the stethoscope. The earpieces should be angled forward. Uh, the bell of the diaphragm and should be placed with the light steady in complete contact with the skin. So you need to be the one holding that. You want to avoid contact with the cuff um, with the end of the stethoscope to, to avoid any extraneous sounds that can distract you. But you're going to deflate that cuff gradually. You release the airlock so that the dial drops very gradually and steadily, approximately two to three lines per second. And you listen for the first sound, the systolic, that first tap, tap. That's the systole. This is the beginning of the flow of blood past the cuff, and you note that number. And you continue to release the pressure slowly. The sound will continue, first becoming louder, then diminishing, then becoming muffled, and then finally disappearing. So you note the number on the dial where that last distinct tap was heard, and that's the number of the diastolic pressure. So you're going to uh, release that, uh, or write that down. You release further, maybe about 10 points until all the sounds cease, and then once that happens, you deflate the cuff, take the cuff off. You let rest, uh, the rest of the air out rapidly. You want to wait for about 30 seconds before inflating the cuff again, and you repeat it. And then what you're going to do is do an average of the two. So every new patient coming through the clinic, every recare patient, whether you've seen them three months ago or, or whatever, you're going to take the blood pressure twice on that first visit. If things are within normal limits, you're only taking it once thereafter. Refer to your clinic manual for uh, the clinic parameters. Blood pressures are written as a fraction, so 120 over 80, for example, and uh, that is considered pre-hypertension now. High blood pressure, hypertension, is um, a serious condition. It's a silent killer. One out of three individuals in America have high blood pressure and don't know it. High blood pressure is considered anything over 140 over 90 and is associated with cardiovascular diseases, strokes, kidney failure, premature death. 
contributing factors to hypertension include smoking, stress, obesity, alcohol, and information about the patient's blood pressure is essential during dental and dental hygiene procedures. Blood pressure readings uh, most usually are recorded with the medical history and other assessment data. There is something called white coat syndrome or white coat hypertension. I have that. And it's more commonly in the elderly. I resent that statement. And reported as frequently um, among centurions. So the older you are, the more white coat syndrome you have, you're likely to have. Readings taken at the start of the appointment can be significantly higher than those taken at the end of the appointment. So you want to establish a baseline reading and determine the need for patient referral. And I can't tell you over the years how many times patients have called me back saying, thank you, I went to my doctor, I'm now on blood pressure medication, and I just thank you. All right, so you can see that the clinician is holding the end of the stethoscope, and the forearm is um, properly supported at that heart level. This happens to be on a, and I'm pointing to it, and you can't see it, on an armrest, right? You don't put it on your leg. It can be on the patient's leg, but not on your leg. Proper placement of the ear pieces, all right, and uh, improper ones, they should the angle towards the inside of your ear. This is just illustrating the correct stethoscope end piece placement. Good contact with the skin, but it looks like the arm is resting, uh, the patient arm is resting on the clinician's thigh, so that is a major no-no. High blood pressure is a serious condition, so we take this seriously. Have your clinic policy manual available with you in clinic so you can refer to it if uh, your patient has blood pressure out of the normal range and you're thinking, do I need a medical consult? Can I continue my care with them today? What do I need to do? It outlines all of that. So for follow-up, we need to advise the patient as, and refer the patient. I did have one patient that I took a blood pressure on, a, a young African-American African male. He had extremely high blood pressure, and um, the doctor, I, I informed the doctor when he came in to do the exam, and uh, the patient said, well, I'll take care of it when I uh, get back from vacation, uh, maybe in the next couple of months, and lo and behold, my, uh, my doctor um, looked at the blood pressure readings and said, you don't understand. No, you need to do this before you go on vacation. And he did, and he was one of the ones that called back and said my doctor was really horrified at how high his blood pressure had gotten since he had seen him last. So even though it seems like a little thing that we do for our patients, it can really be life-changing for them. But um, we're taking vital signs in clinic all the time on all of our patients, and I hope that this is something that you continue to do in private practice even if your practice isn't doing it. Start taking blood pressures on them. Start with just blood pressures. Uh, I've taken blood pressure on every patient since the day I graduated in 1981, that was, and as well as doing oral cancer exams. That's what I took away from my education. Uh, you have to pick and choose what you want to do because when you have a three-hour appointment and they are expecting you to whittle it down to 45 to 50 minutes, um, sometimes you just can't do it all. So you need to figure out what is important for you. But the criteria is to recheck within one year if things are uh, within normal limits. Best practice is to recheck it at every visit, and that's what we do. That's what we teach. Our clinic policy is to check it at every visit. Usual practice is at every recare. And honestly, unless I was giving local anesthesia or doing something out of the ordinary, um, I was not taking blood pressure each and every visit. If I was seeing a patient five times to continue uh, to 
deliver care, I would take it at their first appointment, and if things seemed okay and I wasn't needing to administer local anesthesia, I didn't take it every time. Um, lifestyle modifications you can always talk to your patient about. And again, nothing is done without documentation. We need to carefully document our medical history. We need to document the vital signs that we took. And uh, if anesthesia is included, especially, we need to be taking these vital signs. So we need to be able to tell our patients why we are taking blood pressure and the importance of blood pressure on their overall health and encourage regular continuing care for our patients and encourage healthy lifestyle, tobacco cessation, exercise, that type of thing. All right, so that is the end of um, our vital signs.